Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Special Episode 2, From the Step to Your Table. As history fans, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the Colombian Exchange and how it brought potatoes, tomatoes, chilies and chocolate to the rest of the world, where they became such an integral part of our diets that it is hard to imagine being without them. But thousands of years before Columbus sailed to the Americas, the development of the nomadic steppe lifestyle and the Central Asian trade routes joining the Mediterranean, South Asia and the Far East facilitated a similar spread of edible plants and agricultural techniques. I'm joined today from Germany by Dr. Robert N. Spengler, an archaeobotanist and author of the fascinating Fruit from the Sands, the Silk Road Origins of the Foods We Eat, winner of the Gourmand International Award for Culinary Writing and picked by Science News as one of the top 10 must-read science books of 2019. This highly informative and entertaining book is a wide-ranging and detailed look at thousands of years of archaeology, botany, genetics and various aspects of Eurasian history, which I recommend to anyone interested in the region. See the show notes and episode blog post for a link to purchase. It is available in physical, ebook, and audiobook versions. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the show, Robert. And uh, would you like to just introduce yourself for our listeners? Robert Spengler. I'm the director of the Archaeobotany Laboratories at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. And we're here in Jena, Germany. And I run a a small team of scholars interested in studying what humans ate in the ancient world. Uh, And we're particularly interested in plants in in my lab. Right, that's a very interesting subject, I'm sure. Now, I think when people think of archaeology, it's very easy to imagine digging up buildings and artifacts and other things. So what does an archaeobotanist look for? And how do things like seeds get preserved for you to find them thousands of years later? Great questions. And I, I do think archaeobotany often gets overlooked in the, the fervor to find big flashy artifacts that can go in museum displays. But But we can actually tell a lot about people in the past based on uh, plants that do preserve an archaeological site. So, so we join up with projects, and and most of uh, the collaborations I work with are in in Central Eurasia, broadly speaking. And we join ongoing excavations and also rescue projects for, say, development, and collect sediment samples, which we use a, a basic. Uh, processing method in the field called flotation. Uh, The method is, it uses flotation, but it's also called flotation. And it separates uh, usually carbonized plant material. So it's largely plants that have been burned in, in say an ancient hearth or a cooking fire. And the process of carbonization makes them inert to biological decomposition. So it, it allows them to preserve for thousands and even in some cases, tens of thousands of, of years. Uh, the, the actual projects we work on are, are more within the range of 4,000 to 1,000 years old. And, and we work a lot in settlement sites. So ancient occupation sites where where either, say, pastoralist populations in the mountains used to live, or in some cases, large urban sites, uh, such as our newer projects on the Silk Road trade route, looking at at basically most of the biggest cities of the ancient Silk Road. And we're trying to figure out what plants were moving along these trade routes based on 
what is actually preserved in ancient fires and, and kitchens. So one thing I found interesting in your book was uh, your discussion about pastoralists on the steppe uh, planting certain plants that did not really require any tending, that they plant them and then come back the season later and uh, harvest them. I think a lot of people have a preconceived idea of, of both pastoralism and also agriculture, and and there's definitely a huge gray zone in between the two. Uh, most human populations throughout history were, throughout the, the, the historical periods, have been agro-pastoralists, but but in some cases, uh, people will lean more towards pastoralism or more towards agriculture. But there are certain crops in ancient Central Asia, and the, the most uh, important one um, is millet, which is a, a, a low in, uh, low investment crop. So, so these specific crops are able to be used in, in ways that uh, do not necessarily require intensive labor. And specifically for millets, it allowed ancient uh, small-scale farmers in Central Asia to, to plant small plants that had very short growing seasons. They were drought tolerant, uh, and they were also tolerant to lower uh, nutrient conditions, which is important in some of the more steppe regions of Central Asia. So it, it allowed, allowed uh, pastoralists to kind of mingle uh, a bit with other economic uh, traditions in the past. Right. Yes, I think a lot of people say that over time, even slight changes in climate had a large influence on how much these pastoralist communities in the steppe moved around. So imagine that they would fade, come in and out. And and, and environment and climate definitely uh, help people determine what economic pursuits they're going to they're going to follow as well. Yes. So, well, we've come on to one point there with millet, that this is something that was growing in Central Asia that people found. I'd like to ask you, what plants have originated in the steppe that maybe have reached out to the rest of the world now and in, we're eating in Western Europe or in East Asia or even down here in New Zealand? Yeah, so I should start by saying the, the two Eurasian millets, so broomcorn millet and foxtail millet, did not actually originate in, in, in Central Asia. They, they originated in northern China, but they spread through Central Asia very early in time. And we have some archaeological sites in the mountains of Central Asia that have uh, fairly early millets going back about four and a half thousand years. Um, but there are definitely some very uh, familiar plants to you today that originated in Central Asia proper. And I, I think one of the ones that we're really interested in my lab right now is actually the pistachio. Uh, I have a graduate student named Bazir Amir Muhammad uh, from, from uh, Kyrgyzstan, and she is actually working on our pistachio data as we speak. And and it's very clear that the pistachio originates in southern Central Asia, and that's simply because the wild relatives of the pistachio, at least the commercial pistachio that we're all familiar with today, they're all uh, restricted to, to that part of the world today. So this is the northern Iranian plateau up to, say, Fergana in in uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, but But the... Wild pistachios grow largely in the mountain foothill zones, and there's evidence that people may have started to cultivate them and move them around by the early medieval period. And they they start to appear in other areas like Syria uh, by around that time, and and eventually by the later medieval period, make their way into the Mediterranean as well. Uh, and I think the probably the most famous uh, plant, domesticated plant, to come out of Central Asia is the apple. And this is the one that gets the most uh, attention. I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that it comes from uh, southern Kazakhstan in the Tian Shan Mountains. Um, and that's uh, something that's very much interested me and, and my, my team. But, but I think we're more interested in the fact that the origins in Kazakhstan is actually just kind of the first chapter in the story of the apple. And it, it, it's genetic material uh, largely traces back to this one small population that still exists today 
uh, near the city of Almaty in Kazakhstan in just three river valleys in, in the um, foothills of the mountains there. But uh, it's clear from genetic work, and this is not actually my work, this is work done by uh, several different teams of geneticists now, that the apple moved along these ancient Silk Road trade routes and, and spread uh, through southern Central Asia and up into the Caucasus where it mingled with a another apple relative called Malus orientalis, and then from there also spread into Europe proper and and hybridized with the European wild apples. So, so what we think of as the apple today is actually a hybrid of three or four different wild apple species, but the, the largest uh, genetic material of our modern apples comes from these, these tea and shan apples in, in southern Kazakhstan. So, so one of the things my team is actually doing is looking for apple seeds in archaeological sites in Central Asia. Yeah, that's, uh, I have another question on this subject. It's quite easy to imagine how grains or nuts can be transported over fairly large distances and replanted in other areas. But how did fruit move around in the old days? Yeah, I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that if you plant an apple seed, you're likely to get some form of a, a crab apple tree. They don't, they don't breed true. So most of the apples we eat today are actually uh, clones. They're, they're grafted hybrids, uh, grafted clones of hybrids. Uh, so originally when these were moving on the Silk Road, they were probably moving as seeds, uh, but they could have also been moving as little, little saplings or little trees. Um, but once the, the uh, original apples from the Tian Shan were brought into contact with their, their relatives in Europe and the Caucasus, uh, they hybridized. And those hybrids then had to be locked into place through grafting and cloning, which says a lot about the uh, awareness of how plants work and how they grow that these ancient people had, that they, they knew uh, up to 2,000 years ago that they could take branches off of one tree and attach them to another tree, and they're able to preserve these hybrids that they could not preserve through planting an apple seed. So after that point, they would have had to be moved as actual trees, not, not so much as the seed. Right. Yeah, that was actually another question that I had. Was obviously, some of these things would have moved with people as there was you know, almost continuous migration going on across the steppe for thousands of years. And other things would have been moved as goods for trade, you know, apples or other fruits as kind of a luxury good of the time. Do we know anything about like which things were which and which times they went at? Uh, the timing of, of when certain plants become Commodities on the Silk Road, this is a, a topic that has interested me for, for quite a while. I actually have a book on the topic, uh, Fruit from the Sands, which uh, is written uh, for a, a popular audience. So it's very accessible if this is something that actually interests you. But, but uh, for example, when uh, walnuts become more common in the archaeological record in Central Asia, or when we find the first almonds in, in Central Asia, these are all questions that we're really interested in. And even before some of that, things like when, when cotton, which is obviously a very important uh, crop in Southern Central Asia today, it's very much tied into uh, industrial production during the Russian period or the Soviet period. Uh, but how far back in time cotton cultivation was going on is something that we're interested in. And we could definitely say um, by about two and a half thousand years ago in southern Central Asia, we start to see cotton seeds becoming really common in, in certain archaeological sites. And uh, in the medieval period, after uh, irrigation systems would have been more elaborate and more well maintained, uh, it becomes a more common crop because it is a water demanding crop and it's, it is cultivated in some pretty arid regions today and probably was in the past as well. Yeah, you know, of course, Central Asia, the rivers would have had more water in them in 
previous yeah, times. Yeah, even 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 uh, just going back a few decades, the glacial melt has changed a lot. So so yeah, it's definitely more arid in certain areas today than it was in the past. Um, so as we move through time, uh, from the you know, four thousand years ago, we have no, the nomads out on the steppe. But then when we get to a couple of thousand years ago, we already have more of an established Silk Road trading route. We know there's other things coming out from the Far East, like silk, obviously, that it's named after, gemstones and things coming out of Central Asia. Uh, what plants came from China to Europe? So? Uh, some uh, good examples uh, of early plants to come from, from East Asia and to travel along these, these early trade routes that made their way to the Mediterranean would be things like peaches and apricots. Uh, so by the time that the Roman classical writers were writing in the Mediterranean, for example, Pliny the Elder, uh, they believe that peaches came from the Mediterranean, but there's yet to be a peach pit found in any archaeological site in, in Europe uh, dating before about 2000 years ago. Uh, but they, there's such a, a wonderful fruit that by the time they get, or shortly after they get to uh, the Mediterranean, they kind of just explode in popularity. And they're at many different uh, uh, Roman period sites, and you can find them all through the southern parts of the Roman world. But but if you go to China in the Lower Yangtze River Valley, there are peach pits that go back 6,000 years. So we can kind of trace the the route and the timing of the spread of peaches across the ancient world simply by looking at the the earliest data points that it appears at archaeological sites in various parts of Central Asia and and, and in Europe. Uh, apricots are very much following a, a similar path, although there's some question from the the genetics that they might also have a, a secondary, population or a secondary center of domestication somewhere in the mountains of Central Asia, but that's still hypothetical at this point. And we're one of the things that we're interested in is looking into that. We are teaming up with a, a genetics team to actually possibly test some of these ideas uh, beyond just uh, looking at the seeds themselves or the morphometrics of the seeds, which is uh, what we are doing. Uh, another good example would actually be the melon, which um, it, the sweet melon likely originates in in China or somewhere in East Asia and, and spreads uh, slightly later in time, maybe in the early medieval period through Central Asia as well. Right, and still a major crop in Central Asia. And... It's very culturally significant across Central Asia. And I always comment on the fact that Every market bazaar anywhere in Central Asia, if you go to the fruit vendors, they will tell you that they have the, the greatest, the best tasting varieties of melons anywhere in the world. And in every single region, they say that. Every melon I have in New Zealand is a disappointment. <laughs> it's the same in America and, and in Germany, too. Yeah, so that's good. And what about going the other way then? So what came from the West out to Eastern Asia through the yeah, uh, one of the earliest um, things to come from, from Southwest Asia or the, the broader Fertile Crescent area and to travel uh, to East Asia is actually wheat and barley. Uh, and they become uh, very important in somewhere around the Han Dynasty where they're, they're brought into crop rotation systems with, with, uh, with millets in the north and rice in the south, but it allowed people to plant winter wheats on the same plot of land that they would plant a, a crop of, of millet in the in the summer, and then they could maximize yields, which is very important if you're trying to build large populations and empires. So, so these trade routes likely played a major role in, in the kind of construction of early cities and, and the the just the population densities that you you see start starting to appear in the ancient world about 2,000 years ago. Uh, another example of something that came from the, the broader Mediterranean area and became very important to China would be the grape um, wine production, the, uh, wine traditions in general. That's They're all moving through Central Asia. Uh, some of the earliest grape seeds from archaeological sites in Central Asia go back about 3,000 years in, in southern Central Asia. So it is now Turkmenistan. And 
And there are grape seeds from archaeological projects that I've worked at up in southern Kazakhstan that go back to about 400 BC. Uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, examples from some of my colleagues' work in Xinjiang in, in um, northwestern China. So you can kind of follow the, the route of dispersal. And these routes of dispersal very often follow what... Uh, slightly later in time become the historically documented routes of the, the Northern Silk Road. Yes, yeah, so the grape was interesting. Uh, in your book, you said that it was a, a major wine producing area, which is probably not something you'd associate Central Asia with these days. I know the Isabella grape, which is a popular one in, in Russia from Central Asia, tastes exactly the same as the Pinot Noir grapes that they have here. I mean, technically, it's all uh, vitis vinifera, so it's all coming from from one region, and, and they're all all related. The only ones that don't fit are the the New World grapes, so like the Concords and and uh, uh, some of the the different wines that come out of the Americas. But they're they're a very different trajectory and story of, of domestication. Right. Okay. And so, if we look at domestication, so we have you know, apples. We have wild here. Um, apricots in China. Um, how long did it take for people to domesticate these? You know, if the apples were saying that we can't really grow them from seed, we have to hybridize them. Yeah, so one of my real interests is, is understanding the domestication of plants in general. And, and I've also gone further back in time on some of these projects, in some cases going all the way back uh, to the early Holocene to to look at human plant interactions and and also to look at uh, fossil remains to l- try to figure out how the plants were interacting with animals even before humans came into the picture uh, and this is is kind of kind of it sort of set the stage for the next phase of my work which is uh, mutualistic relationships between plants and and humans and how the plants themselves evolve to fix these mutualistic relationships. And, and for something like the apple, it's it's all tied into seed dispersal. So obviously an apple tree wants to have its seeds moved away from the parent plant and the, the fruit itself is the way to convince either a human or before humans, a large mammal to, to eat the seeds and to move them from one place to another. And in the case of the apple specifically, whatever the large mammal was before humans seems to have disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene or or reduced in numbers, which uh, set the stage for domestication in that it meant the plant could no longer be moving around on its own. And that's how these separate populations in in Southern Kazakhstan and the Tian Shan and in the Caucasus, how they actually formed because uh, the, the plants themselves were not spreading their seeds. So once humans spread them, all they had to do was hybridize these isolated populations that had been separated for uh, tens of thousands or possibly even hundreds of thousands of years, uh, basically in that case leading to what could be uh, called rapid domestication, just through hybridization. Uh, But in other cases, for things like, like the grain crops, the process of domestication uh, was likely very slow and drawn out and incremental. Uh, things like wheat or barley in the Fertile Crescent, we have good evidence from the, the broader archaeobotanical community that, that domestication would have taken two to 3,000 years for just the first traits to, to be locked into place. Uh, and then many thousands of years beyond that for, for the varieties that we are familiar with today. Wheat. Yeah, thousands of years, millet. Uh, what about buckwheat? Did that go along the Silk Road at all? Uh, yeah, Gretschka is something I could talk about quite a bit, but the the short answer is we are uh, very short on data for, for this one. It's, it's one of my uh, little passions on the side and something that I thought I would be able to do a better job answering, but um, most of the parts of central Eurasia, uh, even in some of the more higher elevation regions where we would have expected to find early buckwheat, we have not found it. Uh, My theory is that it's 
a slightly later domesticate, uh, really uh, coming out of the southern Himalayan region and um, possibly only in the last two and a half thousand years, which for domesticated plants is fairly recent. Uh, but I also think that it, it took a lot longer to to move on the on the trade routes to Europe. So it's it is something that's uh, also kind of a like like the fruit crops. It's moving with the medieval uh, trade routes rather than these early grain uh, kind of routes of diffusion. So it didn't move with with wheat or, or barley or the millets, but it, it did definitely move through Central Asia uh, and seems to have gotten up into Russia. Um, fairly early, or earlier than in other places where it definitely took on a, a culturally significant role. Uh, so what about spices then? Because uh, obviously once we get out into the age of maritime explore, exploration, we have a spice trade really driving a lot of that. Yeah, definitely. Each spice has its own story, and, and some of them are well known, and some not so well known. But and think so. For example, things like saffron are really hard to find archaeologically; they just don't don't preserve. But uh, other things like um, actually the the garlic is a good example of something that we we have uh, garlic cloves from a few sites going back now um over over 2000 years so i think uh, garlics which grow wild across uh, huge chunks of central asia are, are probably something that humans as soon as they came across them they realized this is it's a significant thing that they need to to keep and maintain so uh, they they do appear uh, in carbonized form in archaeological sites on a rare occasion um another one um that that uh, uh we talk about uh, is is Rus, so um, kind of sycamore or some of these these ones in southern Central Asia, uh, and and in the in the later periods, uh, the discussions often go to to the South Asian spices, so things like black pepper and and um, cardamom and, and such. But these are definitely not things that we would expect to find on the the earlier trade routes through Central Asia, and they're probably really revving up, especially in the Islamic period in southern Central Asia, where where there's actually kind of state uh, funded trade, or there would have been, say, palaces that had uh, culinary traditions that really were were grasping on on the entire um, extent of the caliphate for for. Uh, ingredients in the cuisines right so it was in the islamic period those are mainly being traded within the islamic world then after the ottoman empire kind of cut off the silk road in and they're now talking about periods that go beyond archaeobotanical work but there's some great historical uh, work being done from from some of those time periods so so it doesn't really uh, my, my work doesn't necessarily fit into it but i, I feel like it's all a building process and if you just look through time, the ingredients that come along these Central Asian routes of exchange, it just builds up what we think of as queen cuisines today. So Turkic Arabic cuisine, they're all slow processes of, of and, and also all the European cuisines, they're all slow processes of, of building and development that uh, lead to what, we, what we're all familiar with today. Yes, and well, in China as well. Obviously, the wheat wheat's extremely important in northern China. Can't imagine Chinese cuisine without the dumplings and the and the lo mein noodles and uh, steamed buns. So, if we try and uh, relate uh, some of these things to periods we've been talking about in the podcast, I mean, so we have the like Yamnaya period. You know, the early nomads on the steppe, then uh, the Iranic period where we have Scythians and Sogdians and these other peoples across Central Asia. Um, so what was moving around during those times? Yeah, so, so I guess the best way to answer some of that, so we have essentially no archaeobotanical um, data for, for any kind of cultivated plants from, say, Yamnaya, but uh, uh, they're are other methods that my colleagues use to get at ancient diets and, and figure out what people were eating in the past. And there's been a, a kind of um, explosion of research on uh, isotopic um, signatures in ancient human bones. And it allows 
uh, researchers to talk about uh, certain plants. So carbon isotopes allow researchers to determine whether um, a group of plants called the C4 plants were being eaten by people. And one of the only C4 plants that people regularly eat in Central Asia happens to be millet. So in that specific case, uh, human bone remains can allow people to trace when millet appears. Uh, and uh, for the steppe itself, let's say the, the Kazakh steppe, the, this broad uh, area in Central Asia, uh, millet really doesn't seem to be a major part of the diet until about two and a half thousand years ago. And it just increases in, in prominence after that. So, so kind of this period that we would normally in the, the traditional narrative think of as the Scythian period, it, it becomes uh, increasingly more common. But, but prior to that, we still lack any, any evidence that the, the Yamnaya or any of these other groups were cultivating any crops. Um, but we do have good evidence uh, from both zooarchaeological, so animal bones, and also um, there's a new study on, on um, residues in human dental calculus uh, showing that they have herd animals and that they are consuming milk. So, so there's there are um, interesting lines of evidence that allow us to talk about their economy. But but what plants they would have been eating, what wild plants, these are still questions. Yes, I, I saw recently uh, some studies have been looking at estimating the ranges that people moved around in based on the isotopes uh, from the plants they were eating. So how does, how does that work? So there's, there's a few of these studies now. Uh, some of the um, the ones that have to do with the what we would call, again, the, the Scythian groups. Uh, there's a, a researcher, a colleague of mine, Alicia Ventresca Miller. Uh, she's now in Michigan, and she's done some isotope work looking at ancient mobility patterns. And it, it, it allows uh, researchers to look at human bones and determine uh, roughly how much they've moved from at various points in their life. It's, it's kind of a, a rough estimate and it only, only works if the kind of geology, the background of a region is diverse enough. Uh, so in many ways, it's still sort of preliminary for, for Central Asia, but um, one thing that does seem to be coming out of the data is that maybe the level of mobility in the, in what we would call the Iron Age, these, these, um, kind of late first millennia BC populations, it might not be as as high as as uh, the traditional narrative would suggest. Maybe they're not moving uh, huge distances across the the steppe, and maybe they do have narrow ranges, or or they move short distances with seasonal uh, camp movements. Yeah, yeah, that was what I saw. People were saying it was thirty fifty kilometer ranges, which seemed really quite small compared to traditional yeah, narrative yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i think the 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 idea of great warrior nomads traversing great distances uh is well it, it's still romantic but um it's being honed in at least a little bit by by some of the archaeological data that's coming out of this broad part of the world yeah because of course things get compressed from a distance but Obviously, it takes people several hundred years to get from one place to another place. So. Okay, to think about the movement of, of goods and ideas uh, is, is kind of a diffusionist process. So people move things with seasonal camp movements, and they would pass it to their neighboring communities, and it slowly gets passed down the line rather than, than getting on a horseback and moving over a huge distance. Yeah, which is also the Silk Road. How it, worked as well it wasn't caravans going six thousand miles from china to the mediterranean either i think that's a surprise to people when they hear that that the that there would have been short distance jumps rather than than the marco polo style traversing a continent and a half well we've already mentioned your book which obviously i've read and i enjoyed a lot um would you like to tell people just a bit more about it uh, yeah, so it's available pretty much anywhere that books are sold. You can get it on Amazon. It's published through University of California Press, but uh, it's an attempt to make uh, my research 
interesting and and accessible. Uh, so I, I publish a lot in academic journals and and sometimes the information in the academic journals doesn't disseminate out into a broader audience. So uh, it's it's a combination of research that I've done over the past two decades, but also um, uh, a weaving of, of kind of historical sources and um, other lines of information that we have on, on plant use and plant consumption in in Central Asia through time and specifically how the movement of plants through Central Asia shaped the, the food that we all eat today. Yes, yeah. Which is, you know, maybe quite surprising for some people reading it, especially as some of these things happened quite a long time ago. And like you say, even the Romans thought that, you know, peaches had always been growing in the Mediterranean. Sadly, Central Asia often gets overlooked in the history books. And the truth is the people of Central Asia played a major role in shaping uh, definitely cuisine, because that's my interest, but also shaping all aspects of culture across all of Eurasia. So it's a very important part of the world. Thank you, Robert, for coming on the podcast. I think it's been very interesting. And I recommend that anybody who enjoyed this should also take a look at reading the book, uh, which contains a lot more information than we've managed to discuss today. Thank you very much for having me. It was an enjoyable conversation, and I'm always happy to discuss uh, these topics and archaeobotany in general. So so I, I hope you follow up with the book. And also, I'll just say that my website, if you're interested in the, the more up-to-date version of what's going on in my lab, uh, robertnspangler.com also has a lot of important information. Thank you again to Robert for coming on the show, and thank all of you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at how trade through the steppe has influenced all of our lives. And if you would like to learn much more, click on the links to purchase Fruit from the Sands, the Silk Road Origins of the Foods We Eat, in the show notes episode blog post, or on the resources page of the website at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. As always, you can reach me through Twitter or Facebook or by email at hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. Until next time, goodbye.